Oop. <laughs> Welcome to the Free Money Podcast, the Provo Palo Alto conversation about institutional investing that you desperately crave. I'm glad you remembered. That, Provo I mean, Palo Alto. That new login, that new lead just <sighs> flies right off the tongue. Yep. I mean, although, you know, I hope I'm not in Provo for like years and years and years and years. <laughs> I know. I hear you. But, um, and I'm actually technically not in Palo Alto. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, the, the thing is that there's so many different letters for your various locations. Los Gatos. I mean, I love that you live in a town that's called Cats, California. Yeah, it's Cats. You know, cats. And we have big ass cats up in these mountains called Mountain Lions. So and, cool. Uh, the good thing about living here is you learn what to do. If there's a mountain lion that you run into on a trail, do you, you, get your, you get big, you get your body big. You don't turn your back on the mountain lion. It'll get yep, you. Yep. It, it, I mean, there are a lot of uh, people around here, like will carry sidearms uh, in case of encounters with stuff, such stuff. I feel like that's kind of mostly because they wanted to justify carrying a sidearm. Can I be honest though? That's one of the few reasons to carry a sidearm that I can yep. actually get behind. Yep. Yeah, like, I mean, hey, I go, I bumped into bears a few times and you're like, yeah, maybe carry a gun, dude. I, it, it is, it, you know, it's one of those things where it, it, it does seem, I mean, there are places where you should be carrying a gun, I guess, you know. Have you seen this one where the guy is literally being chased down the trail by the mountain lion <laughs> and he's backing up because he walked in on the mountain lion and its cubs mm -hmm. and this mountain lion basically chases him back down the trail for like a mile and he's like yelling and chucking rocks at it and you know what did go through my mind i bet you, you wish you had a gun yeah yeah <laughs> yeah sorry I mean, this is like i you know i mean out here in utah i um there's a i was i, I love to go to all the weird like antique malls and thrift stores because mm. like the, the thrifting environment out here is absolutely goaded it's just like not picked over like brooklyn's Anyway, yeah. I saw a concealed carry corset. Oh uh, my goodness! For a hundred bucks recently at, at this place, it was like so. Again. Yeah, it's a, a corset that, that has room for your nine mil millimeter inside of it. That is uh, pretty legit. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you know the I've got various sales goals, you know, and if I want to, if I want to be, you know, really set up for that, I should probably invest in the proper corsetture. Yep, I hear you. <laughs> People are going to be surprised to hear that neither of us expected to be talking about guns at the top of the show. <laughs> you know? Well, this is how you know, we do it. We just it's get the into firmly, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. the firmly established, you know, our guest in this episode accused me of <laughs> professionalism, and I, I've never been more offended. Holy cow. That's just the, some baloney. I'm sure they'll join at some weird time uh, and, and, you know, give lie to that. Um, but yeah, you, you got any news for us? Before I get to the news. Here's what I was planning to, because I've got a tip for people that I think Ooh. is outstanding. And some mm -hmm. people may not make it all the way to the tip part of the show in about an hour uh, when we do garden tips. So I'm going to get a certain tip out of the way because I have to tell you, maybe I am allowed to say who told me this. It was Ben Mang. Oh, Screw shit. It. He yep. deserves the tip. He was telling me about ESG. Mm. And he's like, you know, here's the Here's my tip for you, Ashby. I call it energy security. Yeah. I call it food security. Mm. Uh, even national security. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, tell me more about this investment strategy that is all on top of energy security. Anyway, Ben Meng is, is on top of it. And so I've been using that over the last week, talking about security. People don't even know you're talking about ESG. They don't I, know what I, it is. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, I actually like, you know, so I, I mean, I have some companies that we own shares in. I engage with them. I, one of the, my recent messages to one of the companies was like, that happens to be regulated pretty tightly by Congress is like, hey, you guys can stop using those curse three letters if you want. Uh, it's not particularly relevant to me that you proclaim yeah. fealty to this like arbitrary standard. Um, yeah. You know, it's like really more about outcomes that you're driving and you do that at your revenue line. So I'm kind of happy. I don't need policies yeah. um, or, you know, some matrix or whatever. Um, but yeah, like I, I the, only if it's the real I, matrix. 
Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. But With yeah, like, I, I feel like frame, framing it as energy security, framing it, as, I mean, the resilience frame a couple mm -hmm. of years ago was also big. I'm still writing papers on that resilience frame. So that's not gone. I'm just talking about how you talk to these treasurers and right leaning yep. states. You know, if I was BlackRock, I would be touting my uh, food security and energy security investment strategy. And, you know, let that speak for itself. Although, isn't that just a different kind of misselling than the old one, right? Where, you know, the old. <laughs> the old. Oh. The old, <laughs> the old me on my shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, the, I mean, the old kind of misselling was like, hey, you know, we're, you know, going to 10,000 chickens are not going to die because of all the money you put in our fund. Um, you know, True. and to say, like, I, I mean, there is a benefit to energy security and all this stuff. Uh, you know, and thinking about and engaging your companies on it, but it's so like obtuse and you know, bank. Right, so let me give myself credit here, okay? Because I think the language gets in the way of the discussion. Absolutely. And so people Absolutely. hear E S and G, and they're like, all right, their eyes glaze over, uh -huh. and they just stop wanting to hear you. And so obviously, the content needs to be sound. Yeah, you, know, you and I have been crapping on ESG for as long as this podcast has existed. And that's because the content underneath the terminology was always poor. Yeah. Sus. Sus. And so if if the if the security language allows me to go in and have a really thoughtful conversation about where we get the data, how we measure the impacts, all that good stuff, fine, great. Yeah, exactly. I don't mind it. You know, that's why I call it Stanford long term investing, because it I was a way to Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that you are so thoughtful in terms of sneaking into like, I, I feel like, you know, to go at one point in one of these episodes, you were like, look, I don't really care what we call it as long as it gets boardroom attention on innovation. Like we could call it friggin, you know, the I don't know, the a choir or something like yeah. that, you know, <laughs> uh, but like choir. ESG gets attention and it winds up being a locus of innovation. And that's a great place to have the conversation anywhere. They're willing to have a conversation about innovation. You can yeah, drive exactly. positive outcomes. Speaking of innovation, <gasps> boy, do I have some news for you. Ooh. I hope it's innovative. It better be innovative. The Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund's new subsidiary, Sports, <laughs> Sports Subsidiary. You know, they're getting big into the sports investments. Yep. Did you hear this, Sloan? Have you heard about them investing in what's called the Professional Fighters League? Oh, my gosh. I did not hear about that. These are the people that do the ma. I think it's pronounced. Sorry, I've been told it's M M A. It's not oh, Ma. Oh man! Oh my yes. gosh! I mean, I, you could see that as a growth investment. Uh, I don't you know. know. I was a bit blown away by this one. I kind of <laughs> think as you know, the PIF is like adopting Islamic finance principles. I don't know, and I just I mean, feel like beating each other's ass for money. Didn't quite... the Saudi state have a, a pretty well documented commitment to violence? <laughs> As does America. Come on. Yeah, that's, that's true. You know, but like, you know, you're always saying that investors need to realize the the true nature of their identity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting to see the sports investments carrying on, Sloan. I wasn't I wasn't going after them for their violence, but I was going to observe that. Isn't it interesting that this sports theme is it's such really a, taking it's a, off right now? Everywhere, all of a sudden, it, yeah. like I, I think I, you know, the I first heard it in kind of niche zones. I think Ted Seides did a podcast about it, like maybe six yeah. months ago, seven months ago. Um, you know, and it, there was there were a couple of CFA discussions over the years, but like it, all of a sudden, it's in headlines, it's in mailers, and it, it. I don't know. I mean, it seems like a strange place to get all hyped up, although. I could see I don't why know what the upside is it, it, it's not going to have venture returns, but I think it's going to have like it's like when people were buying trophy assets in New York City. The Absolutely. downside is limited. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like so there's a liquidity benefit to having these prestige assets that, you know, an investor like Piff 
you're going to preserve the capital. If you're not going to grow it, you're going to preserve it. And then maybe there's all the extra financial benefits of like you get big buff fighters to yeah. come to the kingdom and beat each other up. I, I mean, there are certainly like benefits for like, you know, staff entertainment, uh, True. you know, to this or, you know, like I, I feel like the, um, you know, one of the things I'm always looking at when I'm looking at a company is like, is this is the management like an empire builder? Are they trying to kind of, you know, gratify themselves and like get a nicer yep. office in a nicer city? Um, you know, if you were hmm. an imperious CIO, uh, this would be a great way to pad your nest is to own a trophy asset of some kind. And even better, if you can legitimate it within your portfolio. True. Next bit of news. Got two good ones here. The <sighs> Japanese government pension investment fund. Sloan. <laughs> this is, is my new thing. I'm just going to pronounce it. Get out of here. Get out of here. All right, fine. That's what we're going to call it from now on. Jipuff. The Japuff is huge. It yeah. might be the biggest pension on earth. Mm -hmm. um, it might be the second biggest institutional investment or officer. No, sorry. Investor on earth behind SAFE in China. It has decided, much to my shock, not awe though, but shock, that they are going to aggressively pursue active management and they have appointed going from seven to, I can't find it, 30 managers. I take notes, Sloan. I want you to know I'm doing that's, homework. That's here. a lot. That's, I mean, that's a lot of growth. That's so, you know, here's the thing that bubbled in my brain. I love the Japuff. Okay. But it's hard to add value in active management when you're the biggest investor on the planet. Yep. And I fear that they're going to start paying active management fees for beta exposure. Yeah. You, you know, although, I mean, like in the hero days, like he vocalized really well uh, a, a philosophy of choosing between managers based on how well they can control externalities. Yes. Um, you know, and like, I feel like if they're sophisticated in their view of that, you know, um, and their measurement around that, you know, it might not be that, but yeah, like how big is that portfolio? A trillion dollars? Two. Two trillion dollars? Sure. Yeah. So Apple stock trades $10 billion worth of value, worth of thing a day. Mm -hmm. And it's going right. to be, you know, the largest whatever in, yeah. you know, any market weight portfolio, you know, anything they do is going to be hugely influential. That's you know? true. And yeah. but like, it, I, I always find that it sucks when they, you know, they do, they're like, we're committed to regenerative investing. And then I, I try and reach out and they're like, oh yeah, well, you need to be able to cut cash off $500 million check. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last one. There's a new sovereign wealth fund. It's in a place called Borneo. Oh. And I want you to know that I think they put um, the name of this fund into a random sovereign wealth fund name generator. <laughs> okay. And so I'm going to read you the name. And then you could confirm or deny if it was randomly generated by machines. Okay. Okay. It is the Sarawak Sovereign Wealth Future Fund. Ooh. What do you what, think? Random? Random. F what is, I, what is Sarah? I mean, I, I think like, that's the Borneo part. That's, that's the, the that's legit a, part. It's the their, four names. Sovereign, Sovereign Wealth, Wealth Future, Future Fund. Fund. I mean... I it is it does seem like they're really pouring it on thick with the yep. uh with you know the kind of modifiers there. I uh, think we should all have a sovereign wealth future fund. The Ashby Sovereign Wealth Future Fund. <laughs> like is it are you talking about a retirement account? Yeah, that's my retirement <laughs> account. Exactly. <laughs> that's my 401k. The Ashby yeah, Sovereign Wealth Future Fund is actually <laughs> my my SEP. I mean, I, yeah, I do love the idea of like, you know, the, just silly, I, like having so many of these things operative that it's like asset managers where it's like, you know, color and geologic, geologic formation. It's fun. Yeah. I guess that's <laughs> where I was going with my news item. Is yeah. It feels like we are getting into like a whole series of naming conventions like Blue Rock, Blackstone, you know, all of the treat oak you know, trust, oak trust story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Like, yeah, and then don't Wood get me started on the Latin and the mythology, you know, like the, but, oh you my know, goodness. Is, isn't that like kind of in a way, like exactly what the, you know, the best outgrowth of insourcing is, is like the, 
you know, the proliferation of asset management decision makers moves from being these like vendors to being, you know, institutional asset owners. Yeah, totally. And so yeah. why not get fun names? You may as yeah. well go for the fun names. Exactly. Yeah. And like, I mean, the maybe the make fun ability uh, that this confers on the on the sector as a whole, uh, you know, it's good we'll, for our podcast. It's good for our, certainly great content for us. I mean, which is, I think, in terms of structural value creation, I think that's where everyone should be concerned. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think maybe it, it leads to getting more recognition in the mainstream, you know. Um, it does. And, and, you know, I'll tell you, I found this one because I did have a search term for future fund. And uh, I was like, oh, sovereign wealth future fund. What's that about? And then I read the article. It was actually a fascinating article because the politician was like, we got to make sure we get good governance hmm. in our Borneo sovereign wealth future fund. We have to make sure politicians can't influence investment decisions. And we have to have arm's length governance structures. So even though we're critiquing the name, it does feel like the naming conventions are kind of following investment conventions and governance conventions and all these things that we would hope to see in the in the new sovereign wealth funds being established. Yeah, exactly. Versus the legacy, uh, you know, um, you know, asset management industry. But speaking of new funds being established, we have our first of two guests in the lobby. Should I let her in? Do you think? I mean, let's just get if if only one person showed up, we'll get. Oh, them they're talking. both here! Oh my gosh! It's uh. out. Ah! No way. Fancy Hello. seeing you guys here. It's crazy Hello. that you just like happened to be like in this. We were in the neighborhood. Yeah. Like, thanks for dropping by. Uh, our guests, of course, are Megan Kasher and Bill Burkhart. She of the Northwestern School of Management. He of, uh, where the hell did, what's your other gig, Bill? Like, I, I just... <laughs> we, we, we do it all live here, Bill. I just want yeah, you yeah, to know. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, also, an uh, adjunct professor at Columbia, CIPA. Oh, no big oh, deal. Oh, Look MBD. at this guy. You know, you know. It's legit. Um, but, and, uh, and uh, TIIP, or the Investment Integration. Project. The Investment Integration Project. That, that is the phrasing that I was looking for. Uh, but you guys are the, uh, the force behind Colorful Capital, um, which is, you know, an LGBT-oriented venture fund. Um, like why would anybody want to invest in queers? I think I basically go out of my way to demonstrate that we're unprofessional and uninvestable every single day. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think the bigger question truthfully is why do people shy away from investing in queers, right? Why is the market tipped, biased, structurally barred, you know, barred in some way from the, you know, an equal amount of money flowing towards LGBTQ plus founders as to those who are not. Um, so I think it's a, it's more of a question of structural inequity. But to keep on the light note, we're fabulous. Why would people not want to invest in us? <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I, it's, it's such an interesting story. And I'm, you know, I'm far from impartial. I'm an advisor of this fund. And I consider these people, I mean, you know, this is the Related Parties podcast. What, what, I was going to say, that's ha yeah. half of what we do here is, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, related but to like, what we do. When you're telling people about this story, right, you know, there's not one LGBT experience. Um, you know, I mean, we represent, you know, three of the four letters here. Um, you know, uh, and like our experiences day to day are co completely different. Uh, I'm sure. How does that play into the storytelling? Does that make what you're doing harder in some kind of way? Um, I mean, so the, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it from two levels. So I think one is why, so why are, why is more capital not flowing towards ventures led by our community, right? Broadly defined. And I think that, you know, I'm a systems thinker, so I try to take it back to like, what's the, what's the underlying belief that is ultimately cascading through? And I was really thinking about this one. I was talking about it with some colleagues. And I think it's just this, it's a fundamental belief that a monoculture is the most efficient way to allocate assets, right? And the reality of that, and that, you know, because we did this big uh, report on racial inequity and, you know, 
the, you can't like the assumption can't just be that like everybody's racist, right? Like that that can't be the fundamental starting point. It's a huge part of it, and it permeates through the foundations of our financial system. But it's one aspect, right? And so when I was scrabbling with this whole idea of well, what is that? What's that underlying? It's that belief that yeah, yet again, there's a efficient way to do this, and it's predominantly straight white men that are going to be the most efficient at that. In reality, how it plays out then for the members of the community that we're focusing on is, yeah, it's 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 uneven and the experience is more severe for certain members of the community, particularly when intersectionality is mixed into it. And, uh, you know, Megan and I and some we've talked about this, but it's some of the horror stories that we've heard from different members. And and a lot of it's because, yet again, the venture capital world is traditionally run by white men maybe members of the community, largely not. And and so that's where the money goes to those that they see and understand. And it's because of the networks they're part of. I don't know if Megan would add Well, more. and I think, I think Sloan, just to piggyback on the way that you framed this, of course, when you've met one founder, you've met one founder. But, <laughs> you know, when you've met one member of the LGBTQ plus community, you've met one member of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, we seem to have moved past the uh, the era in the 90s when there were five, total of five lesbian haircuts to be found out there. And we could count them. Um, <laughs> we're up to 20 now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what's woven in here when we look at the barriers? We're looking at homophobia. We're looking at misogyny. We're looking at transphobia. We're looking at a different flavor of misogyny and homophobia, which which is more of like an over or hyper sexualization lens that people put on members of our community. We've got layers of racism, ableism, you name it, it's playing in. That's so yeah, I mean, like, that's, I, you know, and I, I'm really excited to press for some specific stories that, you know, you can tell on an, an anonymous basis. But I'll just, I'll just say that when you y'all and one of your MBA students Megan, interviewed me uh, around my own experiences, I was like, holy shit, that's transphobia. Huh? You know, I like and I, I think there's this sort of problem where, you know, those of us who are doing the doing of, you know, starting businesses, like, are often too in the weeds of whatever we're actually doing day to day to like attribute, you know, various like causal factors to our experiences. Um, you know, but I, I think like, you know, it might be helpful and healing for some people to just hear some of this stuff that, that you've heard, you know, other LGBT founders go through so that they can kind of think about if that's happening to them, you know, maybe it's not, you know, just about, them maybe it's a, it, maybe it's something systemic yeah and I, well, and I go ahead Megan. you know sometimes it is blatant right you know when a gender lens fund is talking to a trans woman and looks that woman dead in the face and says yeah but are you a real woman <laughs> right that's blatant that's overt that's right there is nothing subtle nothing subtle about that. And that legit has happened to a founder that we know. Um, and so much more of it, right, is not that overt, right? So, Bill, go ahead. I just wanted to, like, lead with that one because, you know, sometimes it's not overt and we internalize negative messages or, you know, there's something wrong with my venture, there's something wrong with me, with me why can't I access capital the way that others can? Um, because it's not overt and we can't see it, but sometimes we can. That yeah, makes total and, sense. and I think it's it, it's an interesting thing because it how it plays out for different segments of the community. It goes back to that idea that the moment that there's multiple dimensions to an identity, um, that's when you start to see the most severe representations of this kind of put any of the isms next to it, right? Like that that are informing that, and so you, we've got like. A laundry list of these things um and they're all shades of basically people being horrible right like like i mean that's that's the reality and what what the problem with that though is that because of the way that someone's hair is or their clothes or their gender or sexual identification all of those things don't speak anything about the quality of the leader and the ability to 
really build powerful enterprises that not only are potentially good for the world, but also can really drive competitive returns. It has nothing to do with it. And so when you see, I mean, we've been in these different meetings where it's like, you see a founder come in and they're not, you can tell, like you can tell at the beginning of the call, they're not sure how they can show up. And then by the end of it, you'll get that. Thank you so much for just creating a safe space. And then they'll recommend other founders to talk to us. That's the thing. That's, that's that. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if you'd say it differently, Megan, but that, that's what sticks with me. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And the, you know, the internalization Sloan that you were, you were mentioning, mentioning is real. You know, um, I, I cannot tell you there, have, there have been more than a handful of conversations with founders where they have expressed that, like, you know, I've seen other founders raising money based on like a, a worse <laughs> idea you know, a, on the back I, of a this napkin. This is one of those, she wants to leave you really wanting that. Right? I know. It was this good. Is, we lost you for a second, Megan. Oh no, I'm sorry. For the yeah, punch, oh, punchline. Yeah, right <laughs> as you were saying expressed. Uh, yeah, this is what you get for accusing us of professionalism, yeah, uh, no. Bill. <laughs> okay, I, mean, I'm, 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 better. I know better. Finish your thought. <laughs> I'm shutting down some other things that are taking up bandwidth here. I'm not sure why I'm freezing. There we All go. Right, while you do that, let, let me just offer a reflection and then another question while you're de-tabifying uh, your device. Um, First thing to say is we, we, so I run a lot of programs around institutional investment and good governance, and we build a lot of process into organizations to strip out cognitive biases, um, anchoring bias, status quo bias. We, we write memos, we challenge them in investment committees. We do all these things. We don't have good tools for behavioral biases and emotional biases. And I've done a lot of work at Stanford on racial bias, and and we don't do a good job of stripping that out. And so hearing you talk about these biases affecting the flow of capital, it seems obvious to me that you could go and build a highly successful venture capital firm because the markets aren't functioning efficiently because these biases exist, then you can go and capitalize on it by building an amazing community and you can be the ones to kind of take advantage. That's a terrible way of describing what you do when there's a bias, but, but that's, that's what investors do. They spot biases in markets and they take advantage of them. You're taking advantage of this bias to drive out performance. And so I think there is a lovely story here around what you're doing, even from a, a basic old school pension mindset about outperformance. The second thing I would say, which is now the question I was going to ask instead of just talking, is um, about building your networks. But Bill, you just kind of talked about it. I was going to actually ask about how hard is it to build a network when, in my experience, this community is spread across every industry and every part of the world. So building a, a dedicated network where you can source these deals, manage these deals, I thought might be hard. But you said it, Bill. You said word of mouth. You said you're creating safe spaces. And that is actually a lot of how venture capital builds their network. So just tell me a little bit more about how you build your network and if it is word of mouth, if you're more proactive and, and how you originate deals. Yeah, so so we do it in a couple of ways. Um, we were really intentional in when we were setting this up to be mindful of the fact that we wanted to bring people in that represented different facets of the financial services community, unified by this idea that they are members of the LGBTQ plus community. Although we do have our token straight person, um, but but the idea is that you were drawing from different perspectives, and so that's why you have folks. I mean, so the reason that Sloan and Megan and I know Sloan is through one of our other advisory group members, Bob Danhauser, who was at you know CFA, now he's at Shift, and and so you're trying to get people that kind of cut at this from different angles, right? Because um, they represent different reach within the community to figure out like more opportunities. We have incredible venture partners that are also similarly um, helping to source and ultimately vet a lot of opportunities, and then it's really leaning into beyond word of mouth, beyond making sure that the experience of the founders is positive, um, really connecting with the, we're not the only ones, right? There's a community, Start Out has been incredible as a kind of resource and just a source of opportunities, 
um, insights. I mean, they've, they've been really helpful for us. Um, and so start out is a huge thing and they, they vet deals and that's a great spot for a lot of leaders to go to when they're starting to raise capital. Um, it's unfortunate that there's not a lot of other purely dedicated um, investment strategies that are out there focused on the community. There's a lot of lip service that's played, but it, it you know, we would be remiss if we didn't point out like Chasing Rainbows, um, Pride Fund. I mean, there's a couple of them, and, but but yet again, like we can name on one hand how many there are. And that's really yeah. frustrating. And it's you really, got to two. And I got two. <laughs> yeah. And, and I like... promise you, I can't count that high, but I can count more than two. Yeah. yeah um, and, and despite what you may have heard, George Soros does not hand out uh, $5 million checks to every LGBT backed company. Um, at least if, if, at least if that's a thing, I feel like I'm due some money, George and Borgi. Uh, I'll be in New York in a couple of weeks. You can, you can hit me up then anyway. That, yeah. Like that, that's a really sophisticated approach because real, you know, the, a lot of how a, a venture fund is an organism, right? You know, that is really about access to deal flow, access to information on a recurring basis, you know, and like, I, I love the way that you guys are approaching this, not as like some, you know, oh yeah, the pink dollar has an increasing share of, uh, of wallet, uh, you know, but more as by occupying this, you know, this crack, uh, you know, you can access, you know, just a bunch of ideation in a preferential way. Well, and what's interesting is, if I wanted to go into Crunchbase or PitchBook or any, you know, any listing or index of startups and look for female founders, I might be able to sort for that. Look for founders and companies in the Midwest. I might be able to sort for that. You cannot do that for LGBTQ identity huh. with the exception, a little shout out to Crunchbase, which is now allowing folks to self-identify, which is lovely. Hmm. But even when we can identify ourselves, there are reasons, true, valid reasons why we might, as founders, as investors, whomever, we might choose not to check that box. And so one of the other things that we're doing, which is antithetical to how VC generally operates, is folks can reach out directly to us. There's a contact us form on our website. There is a contact email address. And we will look at those. because. We need folks to self-identify and seek us out, which is truly antithetical, right? Most mm -hmm. of VC is who sent you, right? Exactly. Yeah. Who sent you? I'm in, I'm I'm in Chicago, right? It's all about who sent you, right? Politically, but this is you know this is in terms of capital flow. <laughs> um, and interestingly, generally, when you have even an event and a VC is open to meeting with some founders. This will, there will be a curatorial process where the, the VC can let the, the organizers know what types of folks they're interested in meeting with, and they will sort of say, okay, I'd like to meet with these, and, and then the founders of the event, whatever, will make it happen. I recently went to one where the, the, the founders of the ventures could reach out directly to me through the portal for this event and say, I am... Uh, you know, I'm a trans founder, I'm a, you know, a lesbian woman, I'm a whatever, and I have this venture and I'd love to meet with you. Switching the flow, right, between the, every, the, the, the capital provider controlling all the access to themselves and allowing ventures and founders to self-identify um, is, is a game changer as well. And I wish that more of these matchmaking events and services would do that. Is that that's really huge. Yeah. I, like I know a lot of my trans, uh, kind of brethren and, and, uh, sibling then, I don't, you know, uh, in the finance community are flying under the radar because, you know, they don't want to be, uh, out on their U4s or whatever, uh, for whatever reason. So that's, that's a huge point. Um, you know, as two literal professors of impact investing, uh, <laughs> the one imagines that you are fairly knowledgeable on the subject, but this is the first time you've actually stood up a pooled investment vehicle, stood up a fund. Um, I know that you can know the theory pretty damn well, but when it comes time to actually stand, stand up a regulated vehicle, it's a whole thing. How has that been? What have you learned? Why don't you start that? <laughs> so there are, there are a lot of SEC rules about what one can and cannot say. So what we will talk about is the firm, the, the colorful capital as a firm, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Important caveat. You know, yes. So standing up colorful capital as a firm has been both easier than one might think and harder than one might think, right? So standing up a firm and getting the legal structure and getting the right, you know, back office and, you know, contractor support, everything that you need, vendors is actually probably easier than it's ever been for starting a new VC fund. The bringing in of interest, the bringing in of collaboration, um, also fairly easy. For everyone in the VC community writ large right now, capital access is a challenge. When Silicon Valley Bank happened, it really put a damper on the entire environment. We we are emerging from that as a as a system. We are now emerging from that. And I think this fall is going to be a really interesting um, moment of windfall for a lot of first-time fund managers like us. Yeah, and I, I guess I would say, um, talking about, yet again, the firm, um, that... <laughs> It's an interesting thing. So, so much of my career has been spent advising institutional investors on how to build strategies that are focused on impact investment or sustainable finance generally. And so my work has touched on certain asset classes that I'm not saying we're just a firm. Um, (laughs) And what do you do at that firm? Nothing. We're just firm stuff. You know, I've got a briefcase full of jelly beans. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got a great advisory group that you're a part of, so that's, there's that. Um, but no, it, it, it's this thing of going from more of the strategic level to getting into the tactical part and really starting to understand the kind of nuance that's needed, particularly with what we're aiming to do and equipping these founders in the right way and supporting them in the right way. That's always like, it's always that question of, are we organized and are we showing up in the way that's going to be most beneficial for the founders? Because selfishly, the better they do, the better we do. And, and that's, that, that's been the part that I think I didn't anticipate the really the different ways that we have to show up. There's a couple of anecdotes there, but yet again, I don't think we can talk about certain things, but, but there is, um, there's one in particular, like things that, yeah. So I'll just stop there because I don't, I don't want to get myself in trouble. <laughs> well, I'll, we're going to stop talking about your firm now. So let's, your firm is out of this picture. So now we're talking about something other than your firm. But let's talk <laughs> about venture capital, okay? <laughs> Which again is completely different from your firm, Not your firm. and what it, and what it may do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's, this thing. let's talk about the impact that any investor might have using venture capital. Um, with say a, a strategy based around LGBTQ trans, yeah. you know, but that impact you can have through venture capital on the broader world. Can we just talk about that and like, what are the limits of it? But also what are the benefits of pursuing a venture based impact strategy? So I'll start by talking about some of the limitations. Cause I want us to just be realistic. Venture capital is an alternative asset class, right? It has its uses, And for anyone, right, you want to see those uses in the context of a broader portfolio strategy. When you're talking about impact, venture capital has a particular role to play when it comes to access to capital, which means the opportunity to grow and scale for founders and leaders of early to growth stage companies. What does that mean specifically for LGBTQ folks? Well, what do we know? We know that Folks in our community are sitting at a structural disadvantage economically and in terms of household income as compared to our straight colleagues and peers out there in the community. We know the intersectionality of identity then layers on top of those structural disadvantages, you know, for a household led by two women, for for someone who is you know, LGBTQ and black, right? So these things layer on one another. So how do you, where does VC fit? Well, you can overcome economic structural inequity, or at least you can try and access better economic and financial mobility a few different ways, right? Education is a great way. Owning real estate is a great way. Inheriting money is a very good way, right? (laughs) If you can do it, 
right? Tried and true. Smoke yeah. Them. Smoke mm. them if you got them, right? Hold a straight but, book. <laughs> <laughs> but owning a business is also an incredible way towards economic mobility. But if those structural barriers to access to capital stand, then we still have barriers to that opportunity to, you know, for members of our community, given their multiple layers of identity, for them to overcome and thrive. And what happens when members of our community overcome and thrive? Their wealth and economic stability increases. Those who they employ and hire, right, are benefited. The communities they operate in are, ben are benefiting. And the places where they spend their money are also benefiting. So, you know, there is a rising tide, uh, you know, concept here. I would, there's, so there's two, I guess, additional dimensions. I, so totally agree with everything Megan said. I think two additional dimensions um, that gets into, I think, uh, one of the ways to answer your question. So we often think about the spectrum of capital, and this is me putting the systems hat on, where it's the spectrum of capital. And you think the the purpose of different capital in in the world is different, right? So it's like, if you want to drive incremental kind of evolutionary change of big companies around transparency and other activities, public equities are great. If you want to help finance public goods, fixed income, right? Um, if you want to drive disruptive, revolutionary change, venture capital and private equity are the way to go. And so it's just that idea of saying where we show up and how we show up is pretty critical to the system that we're trying to ultimately disrupt or otherwise increase the health of. And I think it's doubly important because what we're fundamentally talking about, this is a, a community that has been habitually overlooked and undervalued. And what that does is it creates gaps in the economy, right? It creates uh, not just downside, but it also creates like missed upside. And so we often talk about this whole idea of like, it's important as an investor, if you're thinking of a systems lens, that you're seeking alpha, but you're also focused as much on building beta, building the health of the economy. So if you have this, this significant portion of the population um, that has been, yet again, overlooked and undervalued, you're not, it, it, you got to bring them in because then yeah. you don't, you don't, you really, that's where you get to additionality. That's where you get to changing the adaptability of a, of a system. That's, that's for me. And I think any investor worth their salt that has a long time horizon or anything, they should care about that. I, I, I think that's a really important lens is like, I, I remember the first time I heard somebody, it was, actually, it was someone from a Dutch pension, which I'm sure is a shock to zero people in the room, <laughs> uh, you know, talk about building beta returns. It was a, you know, a waterfall moment for me where I was just like, wait a second, you can do that? Um, you know, so thank you for yeah. giving that moment to, you know, whatever baby, uh, systems thinker is out there in the, you know, in the world listening to this. And I'm yeah, sure I mean, Ashby, I mean uh, who, who, who here hasn't read John Lacomic and Jim Hawley's book? I was going to say universal ownership. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, hi. It's, <laughs> where, where's Jim? We got, we just got to phone him yeah, in. Yeah, no, we yeah, can yeah, dial yeah. him in. He's not Yeah, he'll be here, here at some point. I mean, yeah. you know, like people just show up here. It's weird. I like, I, I, it's like a Zoom meeting somehow, but. Uh, did, we, did we actually just enter a Zoom bomb? Is that what happened? Like we weren't actually. <laughs> We had no clue guys were showing up here. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally, totally cool though. Thanks for thanks for being so polished and prepared to talk about your fund. Uh, you know, no, our, firm, our, firm, firm. our firm. Yeah, Brad, not a fund. Yeah, like I never mind. I there's no funds here. No one has funds. Uh, it's only firms. Uh, um, anyway, I'm a firm the one, supporter. Uh, the one thing that I would add to to what Bill was saying is. You know, when we think about the spectrum of impact capital and for, you know, those listening, watching, consuming this, you know, if you haven't looked at the Bridges Fund Management, you know, spectrum of impact capital, please do. Mm -hmm. There was a misperception for years, if not decades, that you could not have capital for impact that would yield market rate returns. Yeah. And, you know, a and a, a VC approach to impacting a broad community that has been undervalued and has faced structural disadvantage in terms of access to capital, it's one of those opportunities to prove that, you know, that misbelief wrong, that you really can drive market rate returns uh, through impact investing. Yeah, and because beyond. 
and beyond. Yeah, because contrary to popular belief, uh, you know, we actually do talk okay and do business okay. Uh, you know, despite <laughs> doing different things in the bedroom. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, the the very nature of our bedroom activities, you might say, is innovative. Anyway, thank you guys so much uh, for for yeah, joining give us. Give them some credit. Some <laughs> some non LGBTQ folks have creativity in that area. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's appropriation, Megan. Uh, <laughs> Um, Wait, also, just out of curiosity, so people will be able to actually see us? No, they, uh, if... no. I mean, maybe or, I, like, at I, some I, point. Did you see the, when I missed my mouth with the cup of water and I spilt it all over myself? <laughs> oh no! Well, now this would've... has to be the first one we put up on YouTube. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I thought you saw me. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> none of us noticed that. No, yeah, I okay, missed yeah. it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Im imposter syndrome much? Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm kicking you guys out of here. Thank Bye. you so much. It's awesome to have you. Bye. Um, you know, there there is so much evidence now that impact investment strategies drive beyond market performance. You yeah. Know, it's I, the development funds. It's the impact lens. It's like you can almost feel their privileged access to deal flow, right? Like, exactly, exactly. Like, like I people mean, are going to invite them into deals just to have them involved. I know people who are crazy innovative that probably would not talk to most of the VC folks that I know, but would talk to Megan and Bill yeah. um, and their partners. And, and like the, you know, it's, we, you know, it's not like that crazy you know I, I feel like an impact firm or with vc firms in general you always want to look at it as a social organism and say how does you know how does this operate yeah you know and you can really get an intuitive sense of how backing lgbt founders could be something that would create be kind of a flywheel effect over time yeah. um you know and like it's i i kind of love being like uh, you know on the advisory calls i'm always like hey what's up fellow members of the gay mafia <laughs> yeah. why not better than yeah. paypal mafia yeah yeah exactly much better than paypal I, you know and like the free money cabal is not quite as as organized as the gay mafia Look, but we can't talk about fnn though if we could people yeah would we can't understand. talk about it yeah. i mean it's just a shame that we can't talk in detail about all the rad shit that's happening with fnn I, I mean fnn is so much we're having a lot of influence in washington sorry yeah. i'm not supposed to talk about it but, yeah yeah um, yeah yeah like big 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 things are happening big where, we, where we go one we go all <laughs> that's a QAnon reference if you didn't get it oh shoot hey one of the things that i cracked up at which i couldn't really talk about was uh when uh megan was saying about oh if you just have to get um you just have to inherit a bunch of money oh totally true you know, you know <laughs> It's funny. I was, I was always like made this joke, like, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" It's like a philanthropist. It's yeah, like, I mean, like, sign me up. I I feel like I would be great at being an eccentric heir. Uh, me too. You know, right? Oh like my the God, I will wear bow ties. Oh, you, you know I what feel I mean? like what you need is the really nice silk robe, like the you know with yeah, the... that you wear it in appropriate places, like cocktail parties. Exactly. Exactly. And you know. I, I think though too, it's like it's hard to really intuit and internalize how much of entrepreneurial activity is related to that inherited wealth thing. Like yeah. I, I was talking about this with someone on the Woodcash team recently, where like you know we were chatting about somebody that um, was a little eccentric who is in some of the networking circles that we come across, and it's like you know how the heck is this person funding their existence? Um, yeah, you know and. Uh, and then we were just sort of like, ah, people mm -hmm. inherit wealth, don't they? Mm -hmm. It you happens. Know. It, yeah. yeah, it's one of those, you can, you can know it, you can internalize it, you can realize it, but it can it cannot really hit you. Anyway, what's been hard for you recently, Ashbones? Wow. Uh, it's all hard. Feels like beginning of the school year. Um, kids oh, are, yeah. Although, you know what? It, both my kids go to the same school this year. Oh, that's So that's good. awesome. So that is not hard things. That's the opposite of hard things. That means one drop-off Syner location. Synergy. Synergy. Goodbye. They're both out the door. You know yep. what I mean? That's fabulous. Um, also, as much as I think Elon Musk is a tool, his car makes a very loud fart noise when you put it in park. 
Seriously? You can put your Tesla in park. You can put up this amazing entertainment dashboard. And underneath the car, through the thing that does the honk, is a giant megaphone. That megaphone has a fart option. You can make a fart so loud you could hear it from 150 yards away. And so what I get to do is pull into my kid's parking lot. (laughs) <laughs> and just rock the biggest fart and, Let one and have rip. my kids be like oh my god that's dad i've got to go get in that car that's making that fart noise everybody's oh my like looking around anyway these are lo- none of this stuff is hard but it's um it's interesting i think it's the spice of life you might say <laughs> what's hard for you uh, right now it's, I mean, so we're gearing up to hard launch wood cash, right? So, you know, I'm taking, oh I'm going gosh. by Amtrak, uh, in a couple of weeks. Cause like, okay. It, it, it feels kind of fucked up to fly, to sell carbon removal to people. It does. Um, I get right? it. Right. You know? And so I'm taking the Amtrak, uh, to New York city for climate Dude, week. Can you document that? Do you know that That's my son and I, that. yeah, Henry and I, and B, um, B will be mad that I didn't mention her. The three of us, Courtney's not interested in this at all. But me <laughs> and my kids, we want to do a long train trip, an overnight I, train trip. I feel like, you know, it's sort of this like undiscovered country. You know, like when, when I was uh, working at CFA on the East Coast, um, the you, your options for getting to Charlottesville, Virginia from New York City were either to take a, a flight that is always canceled mm-hmm. uh, or always delayed or yeah, to take weather. the Amtrak. You know, which is like hyper reliable, but nine hours. And, you know, I I feel like if I can get good at taking Amtrak, um, that's just like a huge, you know, uh, dividend for the rest of my life. Um, You know, there's something to be said for like staring at a train window and having deep thoughts while you're like potentially writing on a laptop. Exactly. You know, exactly. Or, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I'm hoping is to have yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, I got to do some outreach. I'm going to stop along the way in various places and try and do some outreach. If you know, if you know anybody who wants to buy carbon removal credits, guys, reach out. <laughs> um, but uh, the like, shark but basically kick your ass for, for selling stuff. Shark bait. I, I mean, <laughs> just that's, that's a good that's point. Fine. Yeah. He's going to feed it. I mean, well, you know, I'm going to make you walk the plank. The mysterious other shark bait, like the, you know, shark bait one will come back from the dead. Um, one day we'll have shark bait one fight shark bait two. Holy shit. That would be amazing. Be but yeah, final, anyway. The final episode. My heart. Th- exactly. You know, <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Um, but yeah, figuring out how to actually manage the sales stuff is hard. We're at the point where we need like a CRM and we got to like pick one and yeah. all that shit. They're out uh, there. CRM. They, yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been told there are <laughs> SaaS innovations out there, but yep. you know I think I think what people are really oop, that's the preview again. What people are really excited about, what everyone's really here for, no. is the Deer Ashby Horn, which is playing, loading. Is it playing? I don't hear it. Ah, uh, there we go. That was the that was it. Uh, <sighs> We the best oh. at sound effects, but yeah, uh, just you know, for anyone listening, in addition to giving us five star reviews on your podcast platform of choice, also know that we love taking your questions. Um, you can write an email to freemoneypod at gmail dot com, and these questions can be really thought out, like graduate student questions, where you're like, oh, "Doctor Monk, I read your paper on identity <laughs> investing," and uh, <laughs> oh, I love that. You know, uh, yeah. or you can, or you can do uh, questions like like the one that the, uh, the this this one ha- asked, which I think is you know really quite topical. Um, yeah. What, when did Burning Man become a punchline instead of a good a cool gathering for fun people? Uh, it might be this year. Actually. Really? Yeah. Really? I, mean, I never went, but then again, I've never been into hard drugs. <laughs> um so like you know the concept of like going out to the desert and just tripping out yeah was never yeah, like, like for me i know everybody tells me oh no you, you don't even need to be on drugs to be there and then you read about it and you're like yeah you do yeah you, you do i mean like you know yeah i feel like going to burning man and not at least doing a little bit of mushrooms um yeah. you know is a, is a you know it's like have you it's like not going to the gift shop yeah so i you know in I think the opportunities I've had to do Burning Man, I was just like little kids. It's like, mm. it just never fit. 
but this year in particular with the with the rain and the nastiness i think like people saw you know the sheltering in place at burning man this was yeah. the first time so this is what people are saying nobody wants to go to the desert for burning man and be told to shelter in place which happened this year yeah, yeah. I, I mean, for me, I think it was when Ray Dalio got photographed <laughs> at Burning Man in that yeah. ridiculous outfit that I like. So I, I, I've like, I've had plenty of opportunities to go to Burning Man over the years. Um, Didn't you expect to see Jeff Bezos with his fiance? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it like would be, I, I mean, that's the problem. It, you know, it's like the, the people showing mean, like, up know, everywhere. Like, for instance, I actually know the guy who runs the Orgy Dome kind of decently well. Oh, that uh, was in the news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The orgy dome is a big deal, and like you know, if you're a sex positive person, it's not that there aren't that it's not that big a world, and like you know, um, but like the it's usually not hanging out with people like that that is like what what's famous about Burning Man. It's like the lawyer who went to the Supreme Court and got it uh, fixed so that Nestle can use child slaves to harvest cocoa yeah. uh, without, you know, violating its, its promises or whatever is at Burning Man. Um, you know, the one that I think the reason, have you heard of the Bohemian Grove? Uh, I think I have. Yeah. It's like, that's yeah. like a California. That's you know, like, uh, the, that's like the next level of cool. I it's think the California version of skull and bones. I feel. Yeah, you, you got into like the redwoods, and 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 I think you're doing drugs there too. I don't know, I've never been, but um, that's where you're getting Supreme Court justices and senators and yep. titans of industry mixing with artists, and and so it's kind of a mini version of that. Um, you could probably talk me into going to that one. Uh, so, yeah, same. I I think like the what the people that I know who are like you know, and, and my old address is like a like in the burner mythology is like a semi-sacred spot or a sanctified spot, um, oh. like a loft building in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a caricature of myself. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but you know what, what all those people would say is like, all right, I'm, I'm over the big burn, but the regional burns are where it's really at. Oh, uh, you know, so if you go to one of the, like, there's usually local meetups or local groups that are a little bit less bad. Um, it's but like yeah. the difference between Woodstock and Lollapalooza. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, Not really, here's, but anyway. here's another great. Here's another great one. Uh, Hit me. How how the heck should I dress in today's industry? Um, do clients expect me to be wearing a collared shirt, or will my work, will my commitment to their success speak for itself? I'm tempted to say, like, put a goddamn suit on and <laughs> and just go full rad, old school. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I did it. I wore yep. suit and tie for a long time. Uh, well, by, by that I mean like nine months. But uh, <laughs> but why not? Try it out once in your life. Putting the suit on, you know, it's like you're going to war. There is in the something morning. to to that. I mean, like I I feel like I have been observably more productive on days where I've put on like you know because I work from home like everyone does these days, right? Like and. Yeah. You know, my commute is basically down the stairs, except I don't go all the way to the bathroom. Um, you know, yeah. so like, but I've found when I take the time to be in actual clothes when I leave my bed, um, I'm just happier. Um, and like, you know, I feel like it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a suit, uh, but having some kind of getup that screams professionalism and interaction is, is a worthwhile thing. Yeah, there was a uh, this like super wounder kid recently that I met, uh, and I've done a bunch of work with, and he would show up to Zoom meetings in a suit, and and I couldn't help but make fun of him. So, <laughs> um, I, I love the kid, but it's like at a certain point you're overdoing it. Um, so I would concur with your take, Sloan, which is like just look sharp, like put on a collared shirt, put on a nice, yeah. you know, put on a nice sweater, um. You know, comb your hair. Be, be vibesy. Yeah, like like take it seriously. Be professional. This this business, at least today, is all about your network. And so, so true. you know, take a little bit of pride. Put on your deodorant. Um, things like that. But 
I I do feel even to this day when I throw on the suit and the nice shoes and the leather yep. belt and I'm doing the tie up, it like it's kind of like putting on the sports outfit. You're like it's go time. Like I'm going to do something. Yeah, and yeah. I do miss that a little bit sitting here in my my onesie. Um, no, I know you can't see me, but I just have my <laughs> my snuggie yeah. on here. Uh, yeah, Ashby's wearing basically the bottom of his fursuit, suit, uh, and exactly. you can see the 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 back of his you know his head is visible on the couch behind him. Uh, <laughs> you know, I di- I didn't know you identified as a fox, Ashby. That's so interesting. I support you. This is a safe space. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, this is actually like I, I think a really interesting uh question uh, you know around i i mean so many different levels let's just ask it so we now we now know that aliens are real thanks to yes, all the hearings do. or at least uaps right unexplained uh aerial phenomena are real um let's assume that aliens have been walking among us in the finance industry uh for decades um what subspecialty do you think they would most likely gravitate towards and those of us that have been in finance for decades know this is true like they're yeah. in there yeah uh, i mean there's definitely people who you talk to i i mean i i usually assume it's more like linked to you know like the caa or something like that you know because <laughs> there are i mean there are firms out there that are like explicitly linked to the cia or to the fsb or to whatever whatever state entity you know out there so I I interpreted this in, with three different subcategories. Do the aliens mean us harm? <laughs> Do the aliens want to help us? Do the aliens uh, just want to hide and observe? Okay. 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 Do they mean to harm us? I think they're working in crypto. <laughs> to me, the amount of energy, the amount of bullshit, the amount of fraud. That like, would explain so much. Holy cow. Like, yeah. we, were, we were generating more energy than nation states to make this bullshit ecosystem function so that, that we would, could yeah. look at fake ape NFTs and think they were valuable. It's like these aliens got us. They're taking us down from within. Okay. Yep. That's the yep. first one. Second one is if they if they want to help us because they're coming in – And they're like, well, it's like the Star Trek philosophy where you can't reveal yourself to the, you know, the primitive Uh, species. uh, Remember mm -hmm. that one? Yeah, the Prime Directive. Holy shit, you know the Prime Directive? Girl, come on. Dude, yeah, I'm literally (laughs) talking about the Prime Directive. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, come on. All right, come on. Sorry. Yeah. Venture capital. I think that's it. I think it's the prime directive. I think they're in you there. Think, you think venture capital is a prime directive? You know, Ashby, like you're the, that's a like the good little... ones are aliens. The rest of them are all humans. <laughs> that's like you know a little. It's like uh, to to Ooh. become a caricature of yourself. Like sorry, yeah. <laughs> like, like I'm being like I yes. see the positive. I'm optimistic about the potential. I just got off a session with a firm called Color Capital. Yeah, okay. that's true. They're out here. The, you know, they they're, could be they're, aliens. they're fulfilling the prime directive. They um, could be aliens. They could be aliens. You know, that would explain a fair bit. Of, um, and then the observe I, and report hedge funds. Yeah, yeah. The, all the secrecy. Boxes. They're sitting back there, high frequency trading. They're they are collecting all the metadata. Yep. Doing some trading, and they're sending back the you know the the insights to the mothership on the other side of Jupiter. Yeah. They, I, I would throw, I would add into that private credit uh, because I feel like I, I feel <laughs> the like right now and report one. Is yeah, that yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, I feel like right now you can basically do anything and call it private credit. Uh, Isn't that right? Holy yeah. shit! We're all private credit managers, basically. Yeah, exactly. You have, you have a credit card. You're a private credit manager. <laughs> exactly. I'm a private credit, uh, you know. Uh, uh, allocator oh, uh, when I choose God. between my Amex card and my whatever. Yeah, I look at my wallet and I'm like, which one do I want? And then people uh. look at me and they say, why do you carry such a big freaking wallet? It's like, it's like I'm a private credit manager, you mofo. Because of all the innovation, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I'm like uh, George Costanza. I've got this big ass <laughs> wallet. Everybody makes fun of me for it. I mean, you know, that's, that's very old school. Fuck you, uh, I'm a private credit manager. <laughs> 
I love that. I mean, yeah, I, uh, you know, there's a, I mean, when we eventually get the merch store back up, I, I, we, I feel like we need like a bumper sticker or a magnet that says that, um, yes. there was a, a cell oh God, site. The merch a... store was so good. Sloan. We had t-shirts. We had underwear. Yep. Yep. We might've had a hat. We had hats. We had, we had hats. a mug. Yep. I still drink I... from my mug. Yeah, I mean, I I broke my mug unfortunately uh, oh, because well, I was putting it through trials just to make sure because our quality standards are obviously no, we got high standards. Yes, yeah, yeah. So. You know, you got to be the high, you know, construction grade. Um, yeah, yeah. But like, I think getting to what's most important in terms of driving value for our stakeholders. What's going on in your <laughs> garden? Uh, how many people do you think forward to the garden tip? I, uh, you know. I I feel like there is a meaningful constituency that doesn't care about investing content from us and is just like, all right, I want some half informed, yeah, hip shooting uh, outsider opinions on what to do with gardening. Yeah, and they like our technical failures. There's I, a lot of people who tune in just waiting to see how we deal with technical failure. I, I know for a fact that a, a bunch of like invest vegan clients do who are and they're they're just like you know it's really refreshing to hear people talk in english and not be like you know all mission accomplished about this various <laughs> about this problem you know <laughs> like the you know so uh who knows who our listeners are i think is the real upshot i, think, um, I haven't checked the stats in a while but it's got to be massive tens of people yeah. uh tens and tens of people i haven't really I, I confess i haven't checked the stats re recently either i am planning to do a little bit of a renovation to the website in october which i'm pretty excited i think about. our website is a little bit difficult to navigate i i think it's um what's the technical term for this bad i think it's bad uh, i'm glad you said it i, I think the it's way bad. that i would describe it is it seems as if we're trying to put our listeners through a series of IQ tests to get to our content. <laughs> well, because yeah, well, even I can't find certain buttons to click from the homepage. I think, page. yeah. I mean, we demand fealty, uh, <laughs> first of all. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, the motto here is it's better to be feared than loved. So, yeah. um, you know, but yeah, like I, I uh, you could tell Does Ephanon have a motto? Ephanon does not have a motto. It does not even have a We're page. Watching. We're watching. Maybe it's a yeah. motto. Yes. <laughs> I see you. I see, I see you. you. I see you where you are. Um, uh, but yeah, all that's happening. Uh, but yeah, like, I mean, what do you, okay, you garden tip. fall's coming, you know, what are you yep. doing? How are you prepping? I, um, I admit that I'm still in this because in the fall is when you do a lot of your planting. Yep. And so there's a bunch of seeds I've been planting, tree seeds I've been planting and this go around with my seeds. I am using a technique called scarification. Oh, I know. Yeah, you're cutting the seed. I am. And there's another thing that you do for certain seeds called stratification, which is to chill the seed before yep. you plant it because it needs to feel like it went through winter, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm doing this scarification and stratification. And I'm just going to see how does that work? I have all my little... Um, I, I now don't just go plant them willy nilly in the ground. I have a bunch of little pots uh, where I'll do. Uh -huh. Here's my strategy: I do two seeds per tree type. Got it. Each yep. little pot. I keep it watered. I keep it actually right by my sink in the kitchen, so I can just Smart. keep watering it. Smart. Good windows there, so I'll keep you posted. I'm hopeful. It's I, you know being able to grow from seed just like makes everything so much cheaper and more fun. I feel because yeah. like and you get better plants because they don't have to go through the whole. I mean, never mind the carbon intensity of you know shipping a plant from point A to point B. It's not good to be shipped from point A to plant B from a no. health standpoint. It's no fun, and they don't love it. It also makes your walks around your neighborhood interesting because you're mm. constantly kind of looking around for different seeds that you might take home in your back pocket. Yeah, um, that's a great point. That's a great also, point. Also, when you're looking for seeds, you tend to see the dog poo and not step in it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, if it's, you're not looking for seeds, you might just step in the dog poo. So there's a, a general couple, safety tip. Yep. Uh, you know, for I, seeds. Yeah, I mean, the best decisions are justifiable on through multiple lenses, right? Yeah, we were having you know, a lot And, of and I think it's interesting you bring up stratification. That's exactly what, what the locus of activity here is. Um, so Provo has this incredible program where you can get a truckload of compost for $10. Um, Whoa. 
Yeah. So this is, and that's like, you know, probably 140 bucks worth of compost in, at a commercial, you know, yard. Um, so what we've been doing is basically covering up all of our parking strips with this like free or functionally free compost. Mm. And then after the first couple of frosts, um, I'm going to go out and lay some wildflower seeds over all of it. I've been growing some wildflowers individually and I've like kind of got them seeded and planted and whatever. Um, but in order to create a real wildflower meadow, what you need to do is sow them after um, the frost so that they can stratify over the winter and then just naturally grow in as their, you know, kind of cycle happens. And like beautiful. Um, it, an interesting tactical question that anybody who's like in thinking about a wildflower meadow will encounter is like, what's the mix between perennials and annuals that you want to include? Because perennial wildflowers will not usually flower in their first year, um, but they create the lowest maintenance, lowest lowest impact thing long term. Um, you know, so we are overwhelmingly gearing towards perennials, um, and we you, you you can actually buy localized seed mixes of rare native plants, and that's what we're doing. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, is this and, where like, your lawn was? That, yeah, is that so, where this is going? Yeah, so this house is this is like the original family farmhouse from yeah. the 1870s. It's like on a corner in a suburban neighborhood and like it doesn't have much of a yard, but it has these huge parking strips between the sidewalk and the street. Yeah. And like something like 80% of the overall physical plant is between the sidewalk and the street. Hmm. Um so we're just going to kind of fill that in with beautiful wildflowers. Um, that's gonna be awesome. Yeah, and it's it's been so yeah, and like there are tons of like you know eight and ten year old homies in the neighborhood that I'm really excited to like let play with it and yeah, um yeah. Anyway, but right. you know that's that's it for us. Thank you all so much. Hell of a show. We love you. Bye. Love you, you all. <laughs>